The following program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a free service of the cable telecommunications industry and your local cable company. Hi everybody, I'm Brian Kenny, and welcome to ESPN Sports Figures, teaming up science and sports. Leading off today, our Greg Abbey joins St. Louis Cardinals pitcher Adam Wainwright to put some spin on the curveball. That. A candy curveball coming. Curveball. What's a curveball? That's a curveball. Four figures. Put your brain in the game. Legend has it that in 1867, William Arthur Candy Cummings threw the first curveball in a baseball game. He, he claims he figured it out throwing clamshells as a kid and noticing that they could be thrown to curve. Other people credit Fred Goldsmith with throwing a breaking ball around the same time. Whoever it was, they started a controversy that would last almost a hundred years. Strike? You gotta be kidding me. You see, some people didn't believe that a curveball really curved. It seems like you'd be able to just look at it and see if it curved, but even in the 1860s, the pitchers were throwing 70 miles per hour, which meant the ball was in the air for only about 0.64 seconds. That's so quick, it's pretty hard to know exactly what you saw. So how could you prove if a curveball really curved? To help us take a look at curveballs, we've got this guy here, Adam Wainwright, also known as the Hammer. Adam took over the closing duties for the Cardinals last year during the regular season and then the playoffs, where he struck out Carlos Beltran on three pitches to clinch the National League Championship and then struck out Detroit Tigers third baseman Brandon Inge to win the World Series for the Cardinals. So I think it's safe to say that Adam knows how to put something on the ball. So Adam, can you give us the basics of a curveball? Well, first off, every pitch is kind of a curveball. What do you mean? Well, any ball you throw is traveling on a curve, a parabola, which means it's being pulled down by gravity. <laughs> Anyone who's ever played catch knows gravity doesn't work like this. Any launched object moves uh, horizontally and vertically to form a curve called a parabola. If we took air out of the equation and threw a pitch with no spin, the ball would follow a perfect parabola like this. But air slows the ball as it travels to the plate, so it does tend to drop a little farther than you might expect. Ah! But anyone who's ever caught or hit a ball is used to that trajectory, so the pitchers started putting a little something extra on the ball. All right, bring it in here, bring it in here. Yeah! So what we try to do is put different spins on the ball to get different movements. Like a rising fastball spins backwards away from the plate. Right, and it's got a higher arc than a parabola. Right, and it drops less than you'd expect from gravity. Okay, so what about breaking balls? Like, how about a slider? Well, if I threw a ball that spun horizontally, like this, on a vertical axis, it would curve left to right depending on which way I spun it. So a curveball is a combination of spins, right? Right. You throw a curveball so that it spins on an angled axis. It's spinning towards the plate, and for a right-handed pitcher, it breaks down and to the left. Okay, so it's moving horizontally, and it's dropping down. It's got to be hard to hit. That's the idea. So you claim the ball curves in the direction of the spin. Exactly. And you really think it curves? Yep, it really curves. You sure? <laughs> I'm positive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try a little experiment. Now, Adam said that a ball would curve in the direction of its spin, but... A real baseball moves so fast, it's hard to tell if it does or not. So we've got these big baseballs to help us see it a little easier. So, Lucille, let's see what you got. Okay, I'm going to give a spin in this direction. Whoa, that one curved a lot. Okay, let's try some other spins. I'm going to give it back spin. 
All right, that should make it curve up. All right, uh, Jimmy, you try one. All right, I'm gonna try a curveball, which is a combination of top spin and side spin. All right. Okay, so it's pretty clear that a ball does curve in the direction of its spin, but how come? Maybe it grabs the air. Like if you roll a ball on the ground with a lot of spin, it curves. Right, that's interesting, but what grabs a ball on the ground and what grabs it in the air? Friction would be the force between the ball and the ground. Maybe friction with the air? These three guys here aren't in the Baseball Hall of Fame, but they should be because the three of them each had a part in proving that a curveball curves. Around 1673, Isaac Newton was the first one to correctly theorize about spinning balls curving through the air after watching tennis players. But 65 years later, in 1738, the next step to truly explaining the curveball came from this guy here, Daniel Bernoulli, when he published his book, Hydrodynamica. What Bernoulli discovered was this. No, not the leaf blower, this. It's pretty wild, right? It's called the Bernoulli Principle, and it explains why blowing air over a piece of paper makes it rise up. Now, making a piece of paper rise isn't that big a deal, but 170 years later, the Bernoulli Principle would also explain why an airplane flies, because of the way lift works on a wing. Bernoulli's principle works for airplanes and for baseballs. An airplane wing is curved on top and flat on the bottom. To go over the top curve, the air has to travel faster than the air passing under the flat bottom of the wing. What Bernoulli showed was that as a gas or liquid moves faster, its pressure lowers. That means the pressure above the wing is lower than the pressure below the wing. Bernoulli then proved that the Areas of higher pressure will exert a force in the direction of lower pressure. For a wing, we call that force lift. But a baseball is in shape like a wing, and a wing doesn't spin. It took another 93 years until the 1830s for Gustav Magnus to apply Bernoulli's principle to spinning objects, with what we now call the Magnus effect. Let's start with just the baseball spinning. The surface of the ball is grabbing onto some of the air it comes in contact with, forming something like a whirlpool. Now, if we add the movement of the ball toward home plate, air is rushing over the ball from its forward movement. That passing air encounters the whirlpool. On one side of the ball, the air is moving in the same direction as the whirlpool, so the air moves more quickly around the ball. On the other side of the ball, the whirlpool is moving against the oncoming air, and that slows down the airflow. Like Bernoulli said, the faster moving air has a lower pressure and the slower moving air has a higher pressure. To relieve that difference in pressure, the higher pressure area will exert a force in the direction of lower pressure. That force pushes the ball in that direction. It will curve in the direction of its spin. Strike one. <laughs> and voila, the curve ball. Now, it's not just the surface of the ball that's grabbing the air. The seams of the baseball are like tiny fan blades, and they're catching even more air. <coughs> now, it's, uh, it's the, also the reason that uh, pitchers are not allowed to uh, scuff the ball or put, put anything uh, on it, you know, rub anything on it, because that would catch even, uh, even more air. Would you guys uh, take that for me? So by the 1830s, science did have the answer to why a spinning ball would theoretically curve, but could they prove it? Could a pitcher put enough spin on a heavy baseball for the Magnus effect to work? Could the ball move through the air fast enough towards the plate, or was it all just an optical illusion? Okay, it's 1867. We want to prove whether Candy Cummings' curveball really curved. Now, there's no high-speed photography. There's no video cameras. They didn't even have cable TV. One of the first tests they tried was to set up two hoops like this. The idea was is if the ball went through the first hoop and not the second hoop, then it must have curved. Not exactly a conclusive test. So, we fast forward.
to 1959, when the technology finally existed to prove that a curveball really does curve. Dr. Lyman Briggs, a physicist with the National Bureau of Standards and a baseball fan, used high-speed photography and a wind tunnel to show that a curveball really curves. In the wind tunnel, Briggs could clearly see the even flow of air over the ball without spin, and then deflection of the air with spin. He discovered that the ball would curve at spin rates from 1,200 to 1,800 rotations per minute at wind speeds approaching 102 miles per hour. Since Briggs' research, it's been shown that even wind speeds from 70 to 90 miles per hour can affect the ball. Now, you might not think that air would have enough force to move a heavy baseball, but don't forget, at those speeds, air has a lot of force. What Briggs couldn't yet prove was whether a human pitcher could get that much spin on the ball. So how could he prove how fast it was spinning? Couldn't he take a video of it and count the number of times the ball turned? Well, he could, but they didn't have uh, video cameras back then, and, and the cameras today aren't fast enough. So, so how else could he do it? Lalo, you got anything? No? It, it was actually ingeniously simple. He just used a cloth measuring tape. You could attach the tape to the ball and then throw it. Yes, and what would that tell you? After the throw, you count how many twists it takes to unwind the tape. And that would tell you how many revolutions the ball made. And that's exactly what Briggs did. So Lalo here is going to help me recreate the experiment Briggs did back in 1959 with pitcher Pedro Ramos from the Washington Senators. Briggs made sure that the line was completely untwisted and that it had enough slack so that it wouldn't interfere with the throw. Then he had Ramos pitch, so Lalo, if you would. OK, Lalo, so what's next? He just counted how many turns it took to unwind the tape. All right, let's do it. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. OK, so the ball had 14 revolutions on its way to the plate. Now, that doesn't seem like very much. I mean, not nearly the 1,200 to 1,800 revolutions per minute Briggs said was needed for a ball to curve. But he was talking about revolutions per minute. You see, the ball was only in the air for about 0.45 of a second. OK, so about a half a second. And in that time, we had 14 revolutions. So it would be 29 revolutions for a full second. Yeah, there are 60 seconds in a minute. So 29 times 60, that's about 1,740 revolutions per minute. Per minute. Got it. Briggs's wind tunnel experiment said that a ball spinning 1,200 to 1,800 RPM traveling in a wind of 102 miles per hour would break about 16 and a half inches. To a batter, that means a ball they were expecting to cross the plate here would really cross the plate somewhere down in there. The so there was curve proof. Ball a curveball really, curve. really does curve. Of course, Nowadays, technology easily shows us what it took 89 years to prove. TV coverage gives us the exact trajectory of a pitch almost as it's thrown. They do it by triangulating three video cameras that record the pitch and feed it to a computer program that maps the ball into a grid. They can even tell the difference in speed from when the ball leaves the pitcher's hand to when it crosses the plate. Dr. Briggs would have loved it. One last thing about breaking balls. What's that? Children probably shouldn't throw them until they're a little bit older. Otherwise, they could hurt their arms. OK. Hey, kid. No breaking balls. OK, guys. What did we learn? Bernoulli's principle shows that faster moving air has lower pressure than slower moving air. And that difference results in a force toward the lower pressure. And Magnus showed us how the Bernoulli principle works with spinning objects. It's called the magnet. The spin of the ball results in higher and lower pressure areas, and that results in a force that really does make the curveball curve. OK, good work. So that's it. I'd like to thank Adam Wainwright and the St. Louis Cardinals, our students from the G-Star School of the Arts, Ross, Jimmy, Lucille, Amanda, and Lalo, the Delray Stallions baseball team, and the Dunedin Historical Society for helping us out today on ESPN Sports Figures. The Curveball Controversy.
over 10 years, ESPN has been proud to present the award-winning sports figures, and we want to thank all the athletes who have donated their time to help put your brain in the game. ESPN Sports Figures airs commercial free for educators to tape and use in the classroom. For lesson plans and more information, visit our website at sportsfigures.espn.com. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. Sports Figures, put your brain in the game. The preceding program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a free service of the cable telecommunications industry and your local cable company.